My name is Eric Perlman. I'm on the faculty here, the research faculty in the Department of Ophthalmology uh, and in Physiology. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the next session uh, with some excellent speakers on the subject of the microbiome, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. More, was it tenfold more, back, more bugs than we have cells in our own body, human cells? in our own body and being very important for all kinds of, th kinds of things, uh, and especially uh, re with relation to our gut and to the immune system. And so speakers will be Katrina Whitson, who's faculty here, and I'll start with, with Katrina. I actually have a lot of hope for the microbiome field as well, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. Um, even if you had asked me a few years ago where I thought we would be right now, I feel like there's been some really interesting progress um, and I'm going to give you a bit of a pie-in-the-sky idea about what I think we'll be doing in 10 years with the microbiome. Um, but anyhow, first of all, I'll introduce you to a little bit of our work and to what a microbiome is. So um, this is my lab over in McGaw Hall on our campus here. It's the big green copper monster. And every year we paint a mural. This one is called the Phages of Orange County and it's uh, representing the viruses that infect bacteria. And the viruses outnumber the bacteria, similar to how the bacteria are also outnumbering our human cells. Um, and so, okay, let's see if I can get this pointer to work. Um, great. So in the last year, we launched a UCI microbiome initiative, and it's been really fun. We actually have 55 different labs who have been consulting with us or coming to work with us. We just gave about a dozen pilot awards um, to launch microbiome projects on our campus. Um, and it's uh, Professor Jen Martini in the ecology department and I who are leading the initiative. And it's a really nice uh, complementary crossover between environmental microbiology and human-focused uh, uh, microbial communities. We have been running a lot of workshops, and if you go to our website, you can see when they're happening. We had a metagenomics workshop earlier this week, and we're going to have more of those coming up, especially now that the pilot awardees are about to get their first data sets back that we've been generating for them. Um, so, also we're going to have a symposium in September that I highly recommend. It's been really fun so far. So, speaking of this crossover between clinical microbiology and environmental microbiology, you know, the environmental microbiologists have spent a century thinking about how microbes interact with each other in communities. And here you can see Sergei Winogradsky, who was a contemporary of Robert Koch, talking about how he really cared about studying the microbes in their interactions with the environment and each other. Whereas Robert Koch, whose work has obviously transformed the human lifespan and has been very important, I don't mean to diminish it, However, his focus was always on studying one microbe at a time, and that legacy continues in all of our clinical microbiology labs where we isolate one microbe at a time and don't always have the opportunity to think about how they're interacting in the community that they live in. Um, so when I talk about a microbiome, I'm referring to a collection of the bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other microbes that reside in our bodies. And they establish early in our lives, and most of us have a microbiome that stays with us starting in our childhood and, and through our lives. Um, in the last 10 years, largely because DNA sequencing has become less expensive, we've had a huge surge in the data describing the types of microbes that live in humans and, and how they're associated with different diseases. And you'll notice that I've used the word correlated here, and I mean that. Um, we now know the kinds of microbes that are correlated with a large number of human conditions, including obesity and cancer and autoimmune diseases, um, and potentially eye-related diseases, I would imagine. And, um, and so now we have the job of the next 10 years of trying to understand the mechanisms underlying these associations. Thank you. So anyhow, in a, in a human and many other animals that have a, a host-associated microbiota, um, the bacterial cells are either around equal to or outnumbering the human cells. There are another order of magnitude of viruses that infect those bacteria that I'm really interested in. The genes outnumber the number of human genes, so that means that most of the genetic differences between you and the person sitting next to you are sitting inside of the microbes, mostly in your gut. And they have very flexible metabolism, so they can consume any molecule you could imagine. 
Um, if you look at the density of the communities, they get to be quite dense. The colon and dental plaque are some of the most dense microbial communities on the planet, even more so than famous microbe-ridden samples like soil. Um, now, I think the eye would be somewhere down here. And lungs and eyes and placentas, low abundance microbial communities, are always very controversial because detecting the microbes in samples like that is bringing us right to the limit of detection. And so we don't actually know very much about what's going on there. And then that leads to big debates, which largely come from the fact that we just don't know. So I've been studying the lungs, I'll tell you about that. And I've been seeing similar debates with the eyes because um, the number of microbes there is not very very large. Um, however, I'll tell you what I think are some of the two key postulates of microbial ecology. And um, the first one is really that microbes are found in every environment. And so I would say that's true for an eye, although I know there are probably a lot of medical textbooks that would contradict that statement. Um, so really nothing is sterile. And also most microbes are not pathogens. So the, the pathogens are the famous ones, but most of the microbes in the world are not causing disease. Also, every molecule can be used by a microbe. And so I challenge you guys uh, during the question session, maybe you can tell me if you have any um, ideas for something that a microbe could not consume. But you know, even chemotherapy drugs, many components of our diet that human metabolism can't access, microbes can consume really almost anything. And that has big health and pharmaceutical consequences too. Um, so uh, say we have about 10,000 bacteria in a human and about 23,000 human genes. Well, we really have orders of magnitude more different types of bacterial genes. And that's why I can say that most of the genetic differences between you and the person sitting next to you are encoded in your microbes. Um, another step beyond that is to think about the molecules that you find in a person. So if I took a mill of blood from anyone in this room, I would probably be able to identify about a half a million molecules. Um, now when I say identify, I mean that my mass spec could tell me that there's an ion um, I, uh, that represents that molecule. I wouldn't always be able to give it a name. In fact, maybe only two to 5% of the time could I give it a name. So that's really an edge of human knowledge is figuring out what all these molecules are in our blood. Um, however, say we had a half a million molecules in a mill of blood, we think that about half of them are either produced or modified by microbes. And so the title of my talk, which is eavesdropping on the microbial communities in the humans, a really important way to do that is to detect all the molecules that the microbes are making so that we can see what kinds of activities they're carrying out. Um, Another important point that I'd like to make is a big part of why each of us have a unique microbial community is because the phages, the viruses that infect the bacteria, are continuously engaged in arms races with the bacteria that live in the same environment. And so there's all these wars where the bacteria will develop resistance and the phage will counter attack with a new method for getting in. And that will lead to a lot of sequence diversity. So a big part of why each of us is unique is because we're each a little chemostat with tons of these battles going on between the phages and the bacteria. So it's been estimated that each person has a billion mutations in their gut microbiome every day. So this is happening quickly and potentially with relevance for health. So in, in my lab, we use a number of approaches to characterize microbial communities. So if we were given a set of clinical samples, we can extract the microbial DNA and sequence it. We can also use methods for detecting smaller, more volatile molecules like gas chromatography mass spec. Um, if we use other uh, approaches like liquid chromatography mass spec, then we'll catch larger, more polar molecules. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of this data today. And then if we're lucky and we generate an interesting hypothesis, hypothesis from clinical samples, then we can go and test hypotheses in in vitro culture models. So today I'm gonna tell you about two different projects. And, and then I wanna tell you why I think they're connected. Um, so I'm going to tell you about monitoring metabolites in the breath of cystic fibrosis patients who have chronic lung infections. 
And then I'm gonna tell you about the potential for using phages to manipulate microbial communities in a more specific way than we're able to do with antibiotics. So um, as this audience I'm sure is well aware, um, cystic fibrosis is the most common genetic disorder inherited among Caucasians. And it affects a large number of people, about 70,000 in the United States. And the median life expectancy is now about 40 in the United States. And a big part of why the life expectancy is now 40 rather than infancy, as it was a few decades ago, is it's because of just an amazing onslaught of the development of antibiotics. And so this just represents um, the different antibiotics that have been developed through the, through the years. And so this has pushed back strep and staph infections, and now CF patients don't die in childhood from those kinds of, uh, those kinds of bacterial infections. And now there's more gram-negative bacteria like Pseudomonas, like many of you guys may actually be familiar with from the eye. Um, so here's how I look at the microbial communities that infect the airways of a cystic fibrosis patient. Um, you have these really dense microbial communities in the oral cavity that include streptococcus and other bacteria that I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, and then long term, you develop chronic infections with gram negatives that can persist and they grow very slowly and they're great at resisting antibiotics and they can persist in the lower parts of the airways. However, um, regardless of how close they are to one another, the types of molecules that are produced, especially by fermentative microbes in the mouth, can be quite volatile and they can travel far. So the microbial products of, these, of this community of microbes can influence the physiology of the community of microbes living in a different location in the lung. And I'm gonna give you an example of one that we've been studying. Um, so in cystic fibrosis, uh, every year patients' lives are very affected by periods of worsened symptoms known as exacerbations, and they're really hard to diagnose. Um, and it's not clear if there is a specific microbial or immune trigger. Um, and so that's in some ways the holy grail in cystic fibrosis is can we do a better job of detecting when a patient is about to have an exacerbation. So our hypothesis is that microbial metabolites could be good indicators of the cystic fibrosis disease state. And it's not a new idea to use breath um, to monitor health. In fact, Linus Pauling even has a paper in 1971 where he used gas chromatography to profile urine and breath samples from people. And he asked them to eat a diet of only liquid, it was in molecules less than 100 Daltons in size, in order to starve the gut microbes. So he was already thinking about the microbiome in a way in 1971. And he found that when people ate this very simple diet of small molecules and starved the gut microbiota, that their, tra their breath and urine traces became much more similar to each other. So a lot of those unique properties that we each have in each of our microbiomes went away when they starved the gut microbiota. So um, I wanted to use this breath monitoring approach and I teamed up with Don Blake, who's in the chemistry department here and some of you may know him. And um, we now know a lot more about what's in a breath sample. We know that about 99% is the same as what's in the background air. And then about 1% of the molecules are known as volatile organic compounds, or I'm just gonna call them breath metabolites in this talk. And probably about half of those are having a microbial origin, and it's not always easy to tell if they derive from human or microbial metabolism. Um, and so we use these sampling canisters to collect uh, breath samples. And one of the first molecules that popped out, and this was in the clinic down at UC San Diego, the Cystic Fibrosis Clinic, and uh, one of the first molecules that popped out was known as, it's known as 2,3-butanedione. And I had actually not heard of it before, but those of you who brew beer in the room might be familiar with it. It's also, it's also known as diacetyl. And it's the main flavoring ingredient in microwave popcorn. So if you've heard of the factory workers who um, add the flavoring to the popcorn and how they've had bronchiolitis obliterans and really big problems with toxicity, this is the molecule that's responsible for bronchiolitis obliterans in the microwave popcorn factories. Um, so anyway, it's produced by microbes, and we're finding it in the breath of cystic fibrosis patients. And it's a really toxic molecule, and speaking of eavesdropping, 
um, being able to detect this molecule tells you something about the microbial community. It tells you that there are the microbes there that are able to produce this molecule, which includes Streptococcus, and I'll tell you why I know that. And it also tells you that you're in a low oxygen environment because it's a fermentation product, and so it's only produced in a low oxygen environment. So it's kind of like adding a little detector and figuring out what kind of environment these microbes are experiencing. So here's um, a little bit more data coming from T3-butanedione measurements in the breath. These are time points in days, and you'll see the CF patient is in red, and a healthy patient is in gray, and then the background room is in black. And you'll see that in general, the red CF patient is elevated um, compared to the room or the healthy person. However, at this one time point, you'll see a dip and it turns out that that's when the patient was in the hospital receiving IV antibiotics in response to an exacerbation. And so here's an example of a molecule that's changing when the patient is getting antibiotics. Um, and so maybe it could be a useful indicator, both of the microbial activity and also of the effectiveness of the antibiotics. Um, in addition, we uh, compared the levels that we found with what OSHA considers a safe exposure and the levels in the CF patient were above what's considered a safe exposure after the microwave popcorn factory incidents. So it's possible the molecule in it, in its, on its own is toxic. And so we use this strategy to figure out which uh, microbes could be producing the molecule. So we go and grab all the genes that are capable of producing the molecule, that, that make the enzymes that can produce the molecule, and then we, at the same time as we took the breath samples, we also took sputum samples and sequenced them so I could map the microbial sequence reads against the pathways that produce this molecule. And so that's, um, that's the idea behind this strategy. And so then, uh, what I'm showing you here, each of these columns are one of the enzymes that are important in the pathway for the production of T3-butanedione. And you can see that um, some of the bugs that are most often containing those pathways are shown in the different colors, and Streptococcus in green, which was not one of the most abundant bacteria in the communities in general, is very abundant when you're looking at this particular pathway. So from this, we can see that Streptococcus, which contains all of the genes, and potentially Rothia, which has most of them, and maybe even Pseudomonas, could be producing this molecule. Then I went and took isolates from the cystic fibrosis patients and we actually grew them with a stable isotope labeled glucose so that we could watch the active metabolism. And we found that both Rothia and Streptococcus are able to produce the molecule, while Pseudomonas does not have more of the molecule than you see in the background media. So this helps us understand where it's coming from. Okay, so just to conclude this uh, part of the talk, some of the things we learned by detecting 2,3-butanedione in the breath of the patients um, are that, well, first of all, it's an indicator of the type of metabolism that's possible in the environment at that time. So low pH and low oxygen environments are happening. And then we can see that there's active streptococcus and rothia metabolism. The molecule can be directly toxic to human cells. And a future direction we've been taking this is looking at how these molecules affect the physiology of some of the famous opportunistic pathogens like Pseudomonas. Um, and then one last methods point, um, for those of you who are interested in doing metabolomics work yourselves, um, we've been thinking a lot about how to store the samples so that we can preserve the molecules and be able to study them. And we found, not so surprisingly, but if you look at the days of storage versus how much a sample changes compared to the gold standard of keeping it in the minus 80, um, samples that are stored at four degrees change really significantly. And we've published a paper about this. If you'd like to see which molecules are more stable than others. Okay, so now to take you to the phage engineering part of my talk. Um, you know, when you want to think about how we could work to manipulate our microbiomes, to push them towards a healthier state, some of the ways you might think of that you've heard about in the news include uh, probiotics, so using bacteria in our diets, prebiotics, the nutrients that feed the bacteria, like fiber, um, and then I'm sure you've heard about fecal transplant. We actually have a fecal transplant program at the UCI Medical Center, and I've been working with Namisha Parekh, who leads it, to collect samples. So these are options, and I'm happy to entertain questions about them. 
And then the one I'm going to focus on now is phage therapy, so the idea of using viruses to target specific bacteria. And it's kind of had a resurgence in the United States in the last year or two. There have been at least three or four compassionate use exemptions to, to use phage therapy as a treatment for patients who are experiencing um, severe antibiotic resistant infections. One of them happened at UC San Diego. Um, and uh, the wife of this patient has become a real champion, and now she's often soliciting help from phage researchers for us to try to find phages for patients who are on their last legs. Um, and it's not a new idea, as many of you know, phages were discovered um, more than 100 years ago, and there are parts of the former Soviet republics where phages are regularly used as treatments. These are from the Eliava Institute in Tbilisi, Georgia. This is a cocktail of six phages that are used in a standard way for patients with various types of infections. Um, and so, so, you know, there's a lot of reasons to care about the phage in the microbiome. On their own, they're shaping the composition and abundance of the bacteria, totally independent of any type of treatment. Um, but then, of course, this idea that we could use them to treat antibiotic-resistant infections is really tantalizing. Um, most of the research in uh, studying the relationships between bacteria and their phages have happened in a couple of model systems, so Pseudomonas, and um, E. coli, for example. And so there's really a need for more empiric studies to look at these relationships and the kinds of bacteria that reside in our guts. And so that's what I've done in this project. We've characterized the relationship between a gut bacteria and its phage. Um, and this was uh, led by a couple of PhD students in my lab and together with the ecology professor, Jen Martini, who's been studying cyanophages in the ocean for a long time. So she has some experience with this type of research. So we had to pick a bug, and this is just an aside, the motivation for why we chose Enterococcus as our bug. Because in a recent study that we, we did at the Children's Hospital in Orange County, we found that Enterococcus was the most abundant bacteria in all of the preterm infants, regardless of their health outcome. So we chose Enterococcus, um, and uh, we chose a phage that can infect it. This phage is found all around the world, and we collected it from a biobank in Canada. And so we wanted to ask a couple of questions, and I'll just tell you two top highlight points because I don't have a lot of time. So how does the phage evolve its infectivity, and how does the bacteria respond and evolve resistance to the phage? So to do this, we grew the bacteria and the phage together over 16 days. Uh, every two, twice a day, we gave fresh media, and we measured the growth, and then we had host controls and phage controls, importantly. So we could follow the adaptation to the environment, and also um, see what happens to the phage when you don't give the bacteria a chance to evolve at the same time. And we extracted all the DNA and shotgun sequenced it. And then if you look at the growth, you'll see the host control is doing just fine, uh, saturating growth throughout the, the generations of the experiment. The phage control is decimated because the bacteria had no chance to evolve resistance. However, in the co-evolution context, where the arms races can arise and the bacteria and the phage have a chance to interact, you see these interesting dynamics. So we wanted to ask, well, how is the phage evolving its infectivity? And um, I'll just show you one of the most interesting things that happened, which is in the tail fiber gene. So phage tail fibers are often an important um, uh, part of the phage that's used for identifying the host that it infects. And we found in, the, in this really large tail fiber gene that there is a region which is duplicating. And we saw really large numbers of duplicates um, arising as the generations of the experiment went on. In some of the replicates, we had as many as five of these duplicates inserting into the tail fiber, potentially making the tail fiber longer. Um, and so then we also wanted to ask, well, how does the enterococcus evolve resistance to the phage? And one of the most interesting mutations that we found is in um, an enzyme that's important for producing the capsule, the exopolysaccharide synthase. And so what could be happening is that the tail fiber is getting longer and the capsule is getting thicker. So the phage is figuring out a way to still be able to infect the host um, 
despite the fact that the capsule is getting thicker. And so I really like this evolution approach because you watch the um, evolution unfold rather than trying to guess what you think the entry mechanism of the phage or the resistance mechanism of the host is. You watch this unfold in real time by um, following their evolution. So um, some of our future directions for this um, are to use cocktails of phages that have orthogonal entry mechanisms in order to avoid the development of resistance, um, which could be a promising uh, treatment mechanism. And so just to put some of these ideas together, if we're able to monitor the activity of the microbes with breath samples, and then we can see whether there's a bacteria there that we need to knock down, you could imagine a scenario where we could engineer microbiomes intentionally. So we see that there's an active microbe, we choose a bacteria that's able to target that strain. And for example, in the case of the babies that are um, dominated by bacteria like Enterococcus, we could open up niche space so that you could add healthier bacteria, for example, these bifidobacteria, um, in order to give them a chance to develop a healthy microbiome. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank my lab members, and we'll see if there's time for questions. Thanks. It's very hard to assess the microbial community composition in cystic fibrosis sputum, and in general, we don't actually see really obvious changes through time. There are sometimes some changes with antibiotics, but it's not so, in some patients, it's very clear, oh, the strep goes down, but in many cases, the patients just look basically the same through time, so. Part of that is because the bacteria produce extracellular DNA, and so you might not be measuring active microbes by sequencing the DNA from the sample. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Phages more specifically refer to the viruses that infect bacteria. Um, however, it could be that those amoeba have viruses, and I have never heard of any kind of treatment against fungi or amoebas using viruses like that, but in principle, it's an idea. It could be. Um, in this particular case, I don't know. I know the community of streps that were there, but it's hard to nail down exactly which one is producing. There was strep pneumonia there. Um, however, back to your bigger question, you know, can we always attribute an exacerbation to a famous pathogen like Pseudomonas or Staphylococcus? The truth is we can't attribute them to that. We really don't know whether they're related to the exacerbation. There's no evidence to support that there's a particular outgrowth of pseudomonas that often accompanies an exacerbation, which is crazy. I mean, everyone just kind of assumes that that's the case. So I agree with you that the literature would um, not expect, you would not find people talking about streptococcus in relation to exacerbations. But that's my point. My point is these bacteria are making toxic molecules. They can even influence the physiology, not only of the host cells, but of the, of the other bacteria. And so maybe we shouldn't be tossing them out. In the clinical micro lab, when they grow a normal flora like strep, they just throw it in the trash and call it normal flora and assume that it's not related to the clinical status. And so that's my point, is that I'm not sure that's the right way to look at it. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you.